What is the uh, neuroscientist's opinion on the Cartesian mind-body split? Right, so first of all we need to know what is the Cartesian mind-body split. So Descartes proposed that the mind was a separate substance from the body, and it was really a different thing. It wasn't a, a physio- physical or physiological organ. And the mind somehow can make the body do things. And he thought that the wobbling of the pineal gland was some kind of interface between a conscious but non-material mind and the material stuff of the brain and the body. And that's a dualist position. It's dualist because it says there are two basic kinds of substance, mental substance and physical substance. And we don't believe that anymore. And in neuroscience, you can't really believe that because we believe that the mind is the brain. And all of the operations of mind, like our conscious thought, our free will, our intention to do things, our memories, are all brain events. They're electrical and chemical events happening within the neurons of the brain. So the idea that there's some sort of exception to physical causation at the basis of human consciousness and human experience has never been supported by any convincing scientific evidence. And really all of our life, all of our conscious experience is all running on our brain hardware and there's no evidence that there's anything else to it. Fantastic. There we go. How long before Google takes over our minds? How long until Google takes over our minds? Well, I don't think we should think specifically about Google. So as far as I know, Google is a great company for the very ethical people and they certainly make products that I love to use. So um, perhaps we should uh, make it a little bit more neutral. And I think there are several things to say here. The first one is that we've always had people taking over our minds and our brains ever since, well, for example, education, childhood, is about your parents taking over your mind and your brain. And there's no doubt that our brain is continuously being moulded by environmental influences and it responds to its environment. So it, you could say that we're all basically brainwashed by society, if you want. I think we have become surprisingly open to direct interventions into the human brain, if you like, uh, rather than using conventional media like conversation and uh, writing. The idea that we may be able to get directly to the head, either to read from it or to change the way it works uh, within the brain, that seems to be surprisingly attractive at the moment. Now, first of all, it works. So one of the things that I do in my research is I use a safe and non-invasive technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation, where we create strong but brief magnetic fields outside the head using a coil. And if we position this magnetic coil over the motor cortex, let's say in the right hemisphere, we can make the neurons in the motor cortex fire. So we can externally take control, if you like, of the participant's motor system in their brain. And we can make them move involuntarily. And that turns out to be a really interesting way to study the motor system. And of course, that's not just of research use. It's of enormous clinical value because, for example, neurosurgeons regularly will stimulate different bits of the brain to take external control over them to work out uh, which bits, for example, may have an epileptogenic focus and therefore um, perhaps need removal or need treatment. So I think the idea of intervening in the brain has a, has a long heritage, a strong heritage. Um, it's an important tool for our research. I think there are two things that are worth saying. The first one is that modern society is really surprisingly open to, if you like, neurotechnologies and to the ideas that we can we can enhance our lives by directly working with our brain mechanisms. And I think 50 years ago, you wouldn't have predicted that. You wouldn't have predicted quite how many DIY projects there are for neurofeedback, direct interfacing, cyborgs, do-it-yourself brain measurements. All of this kind of thing seems to catch the public imagination. I think that's quite interesting. But I think it all has to be done with respect for the individual and with the constant... uh, constant bearing in mind of the idea that individual agents are autonomous. For example, in our experiments, they participate only on the basis of informed consent and that people need to make their own decisions about what they do with their own brains. How is the body represented in the brain? The first and most important representation of the body and the brain is in an area called the primary somatosensory cortex. So 
roughly in the middle, just behind the middle uh, furrow of the brain in my right hemisphere, is a region where there's a set of neurons spread out across the cortical surface which represent all the different parts of the left side of my body. So as so often, there's a contralateral representation. So the cells in the skin, the receptor cells, for example, which receive touch and uh, can code for pain, uh, and all of the bodily sensations that I have in my physical body, they are conducted up into the brain, across to the contralateral side, and you have this beautiful sensory homunculus, as it's called, this picture that you can draw to represent where the different neurons coming from different bits of the skin go on the cortical map. So the map is rather interesting because, first of all, it's upside down. So the skin of the legs and the lower body is represented at the top of the head. And as you move down, following the cortical surface towards the ear, then you find the representation of the legs, the trunk, the face and the hand, which interestingly are very, very close together, possibly so that we can bring food to the mouth, so that we can integrate the, the, uh, the use of our hands and the use of our mouths for feeding, possibly also for speaking and gesture. Um, and there's a very beautiful alignment, if you like, of the, uh, of the body surface on the cortical surface. The other thing about the map, the representation of the body in the primary somatosensory sensory cortex, is it's really disproportionate. So you, the little man in the head, as this sensory homunculus is sometimes erroneously described, has a very large cortical territory devoted to the fingertips and the orofacial region. Lots and lots of neurons in big, uh, large area of cortex, and only a very few neurons in a much smaller area of cortex devoted to things like the ankle and the calf and the thigh. And that's because of the innovation density. We've got lots of receptors in our skin, in our fingertips, so they, they demand and they get a lot of brain power, if you like, uh, to represent them. And that's, of course, exactly consistent with the idea that we have beautiful sensitivity and beautiful perception of touch with our fingertips. And we can use our hands as our kind of window on the world.